All right, so um, these are our faces. Uh, this is just kind of a, a summary of 2020 where we have to have pictures of our face with a mask and without a mask, but that is life these days. So um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yes, I am Jenna Loesch. Um, I do like to always share a little bit about myself um, when I'm doing a PD. Um, I always appreciate it when I'm receiving a PD just to know what someone's coming to the table with. So I like to share that about myself. So I, I graduated from Illinois State University with a degree in elementary education. Um, many moons ago. <laughs> and when I graduated, that was kind of when the te teaching market crashed. Um, so I ended up working as a paraprofessional for three years and I worked in District 93. Um, after that, I did work as a teacher in preschool setting, a self-contained preschool setting actually with Kim in um, an autism structured room and uh, in a self-contained elementary classroom. And then I actually did go back and get my LBS one and I was a resource teacher for a while. Somewhere in that time, I started as an ABA therapist part-time after school. I had no idea what ABA was when I filled out the job application, but I figured it out. Um, and that was home and clinic based. And then in 2014, I went back and I became a board certified behavior analyst. And I worked as a clinic-based BCBA for five years. It was cl mostly clinic and, and some in-home behavior therapy. And this is actually my second year on the case instructional support team. We have a lot of different professionals on that team. We have BCBAs, we have um, registered behavior technicians, we have speech pathologist, executive functioning expert, we have a, uh, assistive technology people. So it's a really great team to be part of. And this is actually my third time working for CASE in my career, so I must really like it. Um, I also work full time in Glen Ellen District 41 as their behavior specialist. And this is also my second year doing that. Um, and I also just wanted to tell everyone, I do not care if you turn your camera off. Um, I know some people are more comfortable with cameras off if you're eating or if kids in the background or whatever, that does not bother me. So go right ahead. I can't see you anyway. <laughs> um, so our topic is about remote learning. And I know people are saying, well, we've been doing this for a year. And actually it's coming up on a year. I believe March 13th was the year that my district went to full remote uh, or the last day before we went full remote. So it's hard to believe it's been a year. It's been a year of constant changes. Remote learning, the whole concept is not new because we started in March with e-learning. That was a lot different. That was everybody kind of, this was something new. We were kind of flying by the seat of our pants. We didn't really know what was going on. Um, so it wasn't super structured like it is now. It's changed. The real remote learning started this year and it started in August. And that's when things became much more structured. We have we had processes in place and you know we really had a, a better grasp on what we're doing. I, I don't think I ever fully know what I'm doing, but we, we had a better grasp on it. Um, but even since August, you know, it's February, that's six months. In the last six months, we have had some school districts have stayed remote, some have gone into hybrid, like my district, or partially in person and partially remote. And we've had lengthy holiday breaks we've had to go on adaptive pauses. I know my district has chosen to go on adaptive pauses. Um, you know, we did one right after winter break and we'll be doing one after spring break. Although we did just have a school that had to go on a two week adaptive pause a few weeks ago because their levels were just too high. We do saliva testing and so that's how, kind of how we knew that. Um, we have had teachers and students have to go on quarantine and we've had sub shortages. So it's just been so many changes. So as much as we feel like we're kind of in the groove of things, we don't know what it's going to look like a week from now. We don't know what it's going to look like next school year. So we want to make sure that we are giving you the most tools that we can. And this presentation is specifically going to focus on how you can use the tools that are in your toolbox to help parents. Because as, you know, with it and, and confident, more confident that we might be with this, a lot of parents still are not. And we have 
parents that are moving to dis different districts in this time where they may have been hybrid and they're moving into fully remote or we have children that are aging into the education system all the time and starting with preschool and maybe their preschool is still remote. So there's just a lot of different changes going on and the feedback that we've gotten by and large is that parents are still not crazy comfortable with this. So hopefully we can help with that. So we're kind of just an overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, we are going to talk about the ever so important cornerstone of everything that is life, which is communication and how you can communicate um, with everyone in this situation. We're going to talk about um, probably the biggest thing that I've been called in for at all this school year, school year and even last year was uh, motivation. So how can we get it? What does it look like? Is it possible? We're going to talk about how to build success in this environment. And I know that we have deadlines and grade books and, and we're just so pressured and, you know, it seems impossible. I've heard the word regression so many times from parents, from teachers, just everybody's concerned about it. So we're going to talk about how we can start to build success or keep building success. And then just some things to remember at the end. You know, I, I know everybody's in a different situation as far as the district goes right now, but just some some general things to remember and some parting thoughts to maybe uh, explore after we leave today. So communication, like I said, is the cornerstone of life. <laughs> and it's so important. And in this sort of time, it's so much harder. <laughs> there is constant miscommunication because so much more is done via email, via text than ever before. And there is just so much room for failed communication or miscommunication. Um, and that's with, you know, you are communicating with parents, but you're also communicating with each other. You're communicating with your administration and with your students. And quite honestly, it's exhausting. And sometimes it just breaks down. So that kind of leads me into the most important thing that I think to keep in mind when you are communicating with anyone and just being in this situation in general is being trauma informed. And I know that trauma informed education has been kind of a hot topic the last few years. So you may or may not have done um, some PD on it. I know I've given PD on it in my district. So I'm not going to go into all of it because we could be here for hours and we don't have that kind of time, but so we're just going to talk about it a little bit loosely, but keep in mind that this whole year we have been through a prolonged traumatic experience and it keeps changing uh, and it's it's relative the, the level of trauma that it, it feels like to each person. You know, we have people who are losing jobs and losing loved ones. I know my fiance was in the hospital. Um, but we have some people who are really doing pretty well with it. I have a friend who's, whose son is thriving right now with all of his therapies being remote. So it's different for everyone, but by and large, this is a prolonged trauma for everybody. So let that guide how you communicate with other people and always keep that at the forefront of your mind because, and if you've had any sort of trauma education before, you've probably seen a graphic like this, um, but on the left, you will see the healthy brain, what we call the learning brain. And on the right, you'll see the trauma brain or the result of chronic stress. And I do believe that that one on the right is from a Russian orphan who experienced um, great levels of neglect and abuse. So even just looking at it, we can see how different that is. But prolonged stress and prolonged trauma can actually change your brain chemistry, which is something that not everybody knows or knows the extent of. So if we're looking at these two brains, you know, red is active, thriving, good to go. Black is not active at all. And the green and the yellow and the orange are kind of just in between. So I'm really gonna draw your attention to the front of the brain, which is at the top. If you notice in the brain on the left, that healthy learning brain, there is a lot of red. Things are moving and grooving like they should be. And if you look at the brain on the right, there's not a lot of red and there's some black and, and it's faint green or yellow, but there's just not a lot of movement, not a lot of action in there. The frontal lobe of our brain is what handles a lot of processing and regulation um, and just everyday functioning. And if you're looking at these two brains, that, that right brain is not processing and functioning the way that it should be. It's very inactive. What happens when you have prolonged stress or prolonged trauma is that your brain goes into fight or flight. 
So the parts of your brain, and this actually, I learned this happens when your body's on a ventilator too. <laughs> um, your parts of your brain that you need for, for survival, for physical survival are, you know, stressed out. So the other parts of your brain that you might not need for survival, the, you know, executive functioning or the emotional regulation or whatever, those shut down to make way for the more important parts of your brain to operate. And they still, I mean, still looking at it, it's not operating, you know, 100% like it should be, but it's able to operate more because the other parts of the brain shut down. Um, so I really like showing this graphic because it gives just such a strong, impactful visual representation of this is what someone's brain can look like going through this past year like we have. So the way that we can kind of move past that and, and help that is we want to focus on resilience. Resilience is building coping skills. It is teaching how to get through these tough situations. And it's focusing on the effort put forth and not necessarily the outcome of it. And I know, again, in a world where we have grades and, and deadlines and ISB and, and all of that, you know, it, there's a lot of pressure to focus on the outcome and look at percentages and IEP goals. And it's, it's so much pressure. But the way that we get to that outcome is by strengthening the skills that are put forth in the effort. And if we don't focus on that, we're never going to get to that outcome. We're just going to fall further and further behind. Um, another way to help with this is mindfulness. So mindfulness is basically staying in the moment. It's accepting negative situations and negative thoughts, but not letting them rule and take over. It is, you know, there's many different ways to do this, but it's focusing on the here, the now, and what I can control. And so this is actually something that even it's helpful for students and parents, but even teachers, I do this as well. And it's, it's very important um, to not get overwhelmed. So this is a practice, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more in depth later, but you know, start thinking about how you can incorporate this into your lessons, into your um, days and how you can help parents do that as well. So when we're communicating, important thing to keep in mind is this is such a different situation for everybody. This situation impacts everybody. And, you know, I hate to use the word unprecedented because I think it's really overused, <laughs> um, but it is for a reason. It's, it's, we've never been here before. We've never experienced this before. So even though we've been doing it for a year, in a year full of constant changes, nobody can really feel like an expert in this. So as much as we feel like we falter and we don't have all of the information, we then have to think about parents. You know, by and large, for the most part, parents are not educators and they don't know how to deal with this day to day. And that's a lot of pressure on them as well. So what you may not always do when you're communicating is ask parents directly how they prefer communication. So usually in, in passing, it's, hey, you know, do you like phone or email better? But you might have to get into a more in-depth conversation about um, how do you want to receive the information? Do you want me to tell you right away when something happens or do you want me to save it to the end of the day? Would you rather get it in a note home? Um, when is the best time that you're available? Is video chat easier for you? Do you have, you know, good internet? So you have to ask more specific questions about this. Um, and then keep in mind, you know, all of these new platforms and everything that we've used, parents don't know those. Um, even as an educational professional, when I was coming from clinic to uh, back to a school environment, you know, in the clinic, we used our own internal process, shared drives. We had a website that did all of our um, email and communication and all of that. So coming to the district, I work for Case and I work for District 41, and Case uses Microsoft, and District 41 uses Google, and I didn't really have a ton of experience with either. So that was a huge learning curve for me, and I had to rely on a lot of other people and, and different tutorials and all of that to help me. And so as parents, they don't know what a Pear Deck is, they don't know what a Jamboard is, they might not have experience with G Suite or Microsoft or any of those. So it's a whole different ball game. And even Zoom, like I had some te technical difficulties in my last presentation on Zoom because I don't normally use it, I use Google Meet. So 
it's just different and it's intimidating. Technology can be intimidating. And I don't know how many of you feel that way, but I definitely feel that way. And, and my fiance is in IT, so <laughs> I, I shouldn't be intimidated, but I am. Um, so sometimes you're gonna have to teach parents how to use your platforms, how to use your modes of communication. So you can do this by, you can film a video tutorial for them. You can find a video tutorial online. Um, Screencastify is a great tool that I learned about this year. And it, it's an extension that you can add onto your browser to just record your screen. Or again, I'm 35 years old and I know how phones work, but I just learned on my iPhone that I can screen record from my iPhone like literally two weeks ago. So, you know, there's always things to learn. So um, just, you might have to walk parents through this because they might be intimidated. They might not know. Um, it's always important when you're communicating to be clear and not leave any room for miscommunication. I know I'm an oversharer and sometimes that can be annoying, but I'd rather overshare than enter into a misunderstanding. So give them clear expectations of how and when you're going to communicate with them, what your instruction is going to look like and what your overall goals are for their children. And then you can kind of work from there. And more than ever, it's probably necessary to contact parents directly, um, whether it be on the phone or text or video chat or whatever. I know it's it's hard to build that into your day to do with all of your parents because we don't have a million hours in a day. I wish we did, um, but it might be necessary to just maybe if you cut out some of those texting back and forth steps and you just pick up the phone and call them. Um, I know I hate talking on the phone, but sometimes it's very necessary. So you might have to switch that up a little bit too. Like I said, everything keeps changing. And, and that's tough and that's tough to adapt and feel like you constantly have to adapt when so many little details are just changing every day. Parents are getting bombarded with district emails and texts and news stories and just, uh, you know, guidelines from the CDC and the health department, like everything is always changing. So what's really helpful is if you can give parents the big picture. So talk to them about what your overall goals for instruction are and what your scope of learning is going to look like. Give them an overview. Um, talk to them about the big important concepts that their kids are going to be learning. So then maybe they have some time to prep because I know some parents like to go and research and you know learn up on that beforehand. Share with them the timelines. How long are we going to be in this unit? Um, when is this due by? What's the pace going to be? You know, we're gonna work on this concept for a week and then we're gonna move on. And inherently, some things are going to be left by the wayside. Some assignments are not gonna get done. Some aspects of things, they're not gonna be in a form or whatever the case may be. So identify to your parents what the major must do's are. What do you absolutely need from them? Non-negotiable, can't do without it. And then go from there. Um, Another thing you can do is survey parents regularly. You can use um, a Google survey, or if you don't you know, use Google, you can just send home like a paper survey, but get that communication flowing about what they need, what's difficult for them, um, what are they finding success with, what additional you know, resources might they want. Open those lines of communication to get that ongoing feedback both ways. So you can send a survey weekly, you can send it monthly, um, you can send it daily if you want to, but keep that in mind as a tool. So in this remote environment, barriers are even harder to overcome, specifically language barriers. Language barriers, when you are on a screen, you it's so much harder to pick up those nonverbal communication things that we have in person. Um, so it's just blown wide open. And we have so many parents struggling with um, just, you know, we don't, we're not literally not speaking the same language. Um, so you can help work with parents to access translation resources. So there's a lot of free apps. There's websites. I mean, I know Google Translate is out there, but sometimes it's not the best and it's not great for larger translations. Um, there are translators out there who might work pro bono or you might have one through your district or there are companies out there that will provide translation services that maybe the district can pay for as you go. Um, and I know in our district, we have um, an ESL 
uh, administrator. So that would be a good person to go to as well. But keep in mind that that is going to be a barrier. So what you can do also is check to see how you can change the language on different platforms. Because I recently discovered that on both G Suite and on Microsoft, you have so many different language controls that I didn't know you had because I didn't think to look for them. Um, so it was actually a result of this, this presentation. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but, you know, explore that as well. And when in doubt, access your buildings or your district's tech person. In our district, each, each um, building has a, a digital media coordinator, um, but we do have one for the district as well. And again, having a fiance in IT, I know that they get called a lot of times for the technical issues and the emergencies, but they really do have a lot of great ideas for resources. So do not be afraid. And again, now more than ever, keep your lines of communication open, not just with parents, but with each other and with yourself. Be honest about what you're struggling with, um, you know, and, and go to the proper channels of people to, to express those. And even if it's just venting, that's okay. We need to do that sometimes. But it can be really helpful to administration to give them that feedback. Because I know I'm a district level employee, so I'm across all of our schools. And I might put these processes and, and procedures in place and just kind of send them out there and then they go into the abyss and then I never hear about them again. But it's really helpful when people tell me, hey, this really worked, that's a great idea. Or, well, maybe, you know, you can add this onto that and that might, might be more helpful. Or this aspect of that wasn't that great in, in, it was great in theory, but not in practice. So give your administration that feedback because, you know, they're kind of in the dark as well and they're trying to do the best that they can, but without that information, they don't really know what the best is. And consider um, collaborating and consulting with new people that you may not, usually different grade levels, different buildings, um, different specialties. I know that when this started, it was really difficult for a lot of our autistic learners. So I actually sought out an autistic advocate and did some training with them. And that was really, really helpful for me to understand what remote learning is like for those students that are on the spectrum. And that was someone that, you know, maybe eventually I would have gotten there, but this was kind of an urgent need that I, I just, you know, was open to something new and was exploring a different avenue. So keep in mind that there's so many different people out there that you can reach out to and, and collaborate with that would love. And I, Facebook groups are great too. Um, some, of the, some of the time there's a little drama in them, but I'm in a lot of Facebook groups that are really, really helpful too that are my specialty. All right, so the big, big, big thing <laughs> that has been the most asked question of me this year is how do we motivate? How do we keep these kids engaged? What does that look like in this environment? How do we do it? Is it even possible? And how am I supposed to help when I'm on this side of the screen and they're on that side of the screen? So um, in the description of this event, you will have seen the word pairing. And pairing is a behavioral psychology term that's used widely in the field of ABA. So basically, what it means is that you are the reinforcement. You are the fun. All the good things come through you. Your, your you know, student walks into the room and their eyes light up when they see you, and it's just you're the fun person. Um, so you do this every day. You do this all the time. Um, it looks like, you know, it's, it's developing those positive relationships. It's getting that trusting relationship going with your students. It's establishing that reciprocity, that, that joint attention, um, that back and forth. And what it's really doing also is it's conditioning the environment for learning. Because I don't know about you, but if I step into a room and, and I'm not feeling it in there, I don't want to do anything. I, the dentist office is a great example. I step into the dentist office and I immediately tense up <laughs> and, and I don't think there's any amount of pairing in the world that will make me not do that. But in a classroom there is. Um, and it's really just taking time before getting straight into work. So that's what this looks like as a concept. So in order for you to help parents do this, you have to recognize how you do it. So you do this every day without knowing what this term was you do this every single day. You do it multiple times a day. So what that looks like when 
first week of school, you don't just go straight into <laughs> academics right away, especially not in early childhood or kindergarten. Um, after a long break coming back from Thanksgiving or coming back from winter break or spring break, again, you're not just going to dive head first where you left off. You're going to lean into it a little bit. Um, even Mondays. Mondays are, actually, I find Tuesdays more, more awful, but Mondays are hard for a lot of kids. So a lot of educators know that. So they kind of make it a little bit easier, a little bit more flexible on Monday mornings. You do it every single day. You do it multiple times a day. It's doing fun activities with very few demands. It's building rapport with your students before asking them to do something for you. Because if you don't do that and you ask them to do something, they're going to look at you like you have three heads and not do it. <laughs> um, it's connecting both the teacher and the environment with fun things. Um, so my early childhood peeps out there, I remember this well, potty training. You don't just plop a child on the toilet and say, go. <laughs> There's a lot of work that goes into this, that goes into conditioning that environment. So you're allowing them to start by sitting on the toilet with an iPad, with a book, with a preferred item. They might be scared of the toilet. It's weird. They don't know what you're doing. So you're making it feel safe and you're making them trust you that this is going to be okay and then you start giving those demands and those instructions. Um, this is pairing tangible items or physical attention with praise too. So before we move into how you can help parents do this, type in the chat, how do you pair with your students? I, in the last um, one that we did, it was really helpful for everybody to kind of see what each other was doing, but give specific examples, or you can give an example of what you don't do right away. So instead of doing this, I do this. Um, so I will let you guys put that in the chat and then um, Kim will read them out as they come in. Be shy. <laughs> um, okay, Megan says class meetings and games. Okay, good. Lisa says we play and that gets everyone talking and having fun together. Just a big one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Playlist says circle time. There are a lot of things that happen at circle time that are, would fall under pairing. Yep, and that's why circle time happens in the morning. <laughs> exactly. Isabel says, I always start my speech therapy sessions with a short conversation and preview of what we're working on that day. No shame in having the kid help plan for that session. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Yep. In a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> or even the next one, plan for the next one. Margaret says, show and tell, something they have at home they enjoy. Class meetings, get them excited about what they're learning. And I need their help with teaching that day. They love being the teacher. Monique says, since I'm not a teacher in the classroom, I don't approach the children right away. I allow them to approach me when they're comfortable when I visit the rooms. So I really like that too. Yeah, that's a good one. That is a good one. Um, someone in the last session said, um, just checking in, how do you feel today? Mm -hmm. That's opening the door. <laughs> uh, Kirsten said, try to, try to comment on something that is just about each student, making them feel special. Like we talked about the clothing, you know. Mm -hmm. about oh, no, no, no. Yeah, they were saying last time a lot of um, them were making sure to compliment, you know, the kids' clothing because kids, if they get a new shirt or even a haircut or we said a Band-Aid, they love <laughs> to talk about Band-Aids. <laughs> and then there's a story. So it really gets that communication going. Mm -hmm. Someone said bring their interests into the room. That's really good. Um, have students greet each other before coming into the classroom. Start relationships at the beginning of the day. Yep. All right, cool. Um, there also is a video, I th the video that we watched in the, um, the keynote, the intro thing today of there's a huge difference between the adults that were snapping at the kids and, and not asking them questions and kind of just ignoring them versus the second half of the video when they were more welcoming and, and you really saw the difference between those two situations. And that's because the adults in the second situation were focusing on pairing and building relationships and building trust. Mm -hmm. 
All right, anything else? Uh, just one more. Amanda says classroom jobs. Everyone gets a job daily and that makes them feel important and valued. And really jobs don't have to be a demand. They can be actually pretty rewarding for kids. <laughs> especially like erasing. They love erasing. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's a good point too because it looks different for everybody. So it might not even be anything that I just said here and that's why I wanted everyone to give examples too because it's different for everyone. Um, okay, so if you have more ideas, feel free to type them in the chat, but I am going to move on. So big questions. How can you help parents do this? Because parents don't think about this because they don't know about this. They don't think to do these sorts of things because for them in the morning, it's usually go, 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 go. Either they have to get off to work or, you know, they slept late, the, the kids slept late, they have to get on. Like they, they don't think about these things because they don't know to think about these things. So the most important thing to teaching anyone something is what I call the why behind the what. You have to explain to them why it's important. How do you do it? Why does it work for you? That's a really important thing too, is sharing your success with it and why it's something that you do. Um, I find that people are so much more willing to do something if they know those things. And so a way that you can show them how to do it, if you're comfortable, you know, we talked about, um, last session too, that uh, you feel ridiculous doing it. And uh, I said, there was, there was a saying that I've heard that's like, if, if anyone were to walk into your classroom at any given time and you were afraid of them thinking you look like a moron, then you're doing it right. <laughs> um, so you can record yourself doing it. If you don't feel comfortable with that, that's fine. Um, there's so many different videos on YouTube about this as well as if you search pairing ABA or pairing students, pairing children, you'll see so many different examples of people that put that up for that reason. Um, learn about their environment. This is so, so, so important because what pairing looks like to you in the school environment or even over the computer is gonna be so much different for parents at their home. We have parents that have all different backgrounds and income levels and resources available to them at home. Um, so you have to work with them about what's in their environment, what can be turned into something fun. We have some families who really don't have a lot of toys because they can't afford them. So what in their kitchen? Can they wear a colander as a hat or a spatula as a drumstick? Or can it just be something quick and easy, creative for them? Um, but also keep in mind that a lot of parents don't know how to do this. They, they don't understand how to play. <laughs> and um, I know that when I was starting out as um, an ABA therapist, it was mostly boys because more boys are on the spectrum. And I had no idea how to play with boys. <laughs> I had to learn. So this might be something that parents have to learn too. So show them what in their environment they can use. If there's a big bucket of Legos back there, teach them how to use the Legos, teach them how to use the Legos throughout the lesson. Um, and work with parents to establish this as a routine, something scheduled, um, and how to balance that into their day. So sometimes for people, you really have to carve out something as something to cross off the list or something on the schedule so that they remember to do it and they remember that it's important. And kind of once it starts to become a routine, then it'll just keep happening. Um, and then think about how you can incorporate a chance for parents to do this into your lessons or your assignments. So have parents participate with you in videos and songs, you know, really say, you know, parents, we'd really like for you to jump in on this too. And again, they may feel really stupid doing it, but it's really helpful. Um, and then, you know, I know a lot of early childhood does not have homework per, per se, but assign them these activities. Tell them, I need for you to do this. Tie it into learning. I need for you to go outside and, and you know, go play on your swing set for 20 minutes or, you know, whatever the case may be. But give them assignments to do that helps them establish this relationship. And once you pair, once you are paired, you would develop instructional control. So what does it look like for you? This is the child following directions. This is the child, you know, like in this picture, they're sitting and they're engaging. Um, they're, you know, they look like they're enjoying what they're doing, but this is basically, they're following the rules, they're following your instructions, they're doing their work. 
how do you as educators achieve it? You do it by pairing, like we talked about, by setting up the environment and by being consistent. And how can you help parents do it? Again, explaining the why, modeling for them, and even coaching in the moment for them. And I, again, I know it gets very awkward, but you can coach a parent through the screen. Um, if it's, you know, like a one-on-one -on -one session, like a speech or with resource or something like that, you can help. Um, and I've had to do that too. And yes, it is awkward, but it's very helpful too. <laughs> All right, so more ways to motivate. Have the children, I know we kind of alluded to this, have the children work with the parents to help create the learning space. Make choices about where they want to sit, what they want it to look like, um, and even, you know, um, someone said help involve them in the planning of things. By and large, as human beings, if we're involved in the creation and the, and the kind of back end of things, we're way more likely to be motivated by it and help it, have it help us perform. Um, reinforcement. This is going to look different at home. It's it's a lot harder. You know, at school we have token boards and we, we you know, we have um, physical items in front of us and we have, you know, we can go run to the gym or whatever the case may be. It's different now. So work with parents to develop a system with whatever resources they have at home. Think about how you can coach them through it, whether it is how to use a token board. And I will explain a token board because I did get that question last time. Um, I just assumed everybody knew. So a token board is basically like a star chart or you have, you know, three things on here and as you answer each question or do each problem, you get a star or whatever and then that leads you into the break or the reward or whatever. Um, teach parents about behavior specific praise. So again, sometimes you have to coach them through how to talk to their child in the way that you do. So you might say, Johnny, I really like how you're sitting in your chair. That's awesome at school. So teach parents how to do that at home as well, because we oftentimes take for granted when our kids are doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, because that's just what they're supposed to be doing. But we also have to take into account how hard it is for them to do that and show them what we like so they'll do it again. Um, the most important thing to keep in mind right now, and I know that this is so hard for a multitude of reasons, keeping those social emotional needs at the forefront because we are not going to get anything that is close to a good result if those social emotional needs are not met. I know that teachers and parents are feeling pressure to catch up and um, I'm hearing the word regression so much right now. And I know that it's a big worry, but keep in mind too that our kids are learning adapting skills. They're learning how to cope in this ever-changing environment, they're learning technology skills. But if we're not teaching them how to be emotionally adjusted as best they can, then they're not gonna engage in those academics and that hole is just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. So right now, the basis, the foundation for everything is those social emotional needs. Um, ways to do this, again, are mindfulness, which we'll talk about, emotions, check-ins, either in the beginning of the day, or if you see that they're starting to get a little escalated. I know some people use zones or, or something like that. Um, and play-based learning, I mean, especially in early childhood. I know that gets harder as you go through, you know, grade to grade to grade, but, you know, really starting out and coaching parents through why it's important to do play-based learning at home as well. Okay. So success, <laughs> it, we are able to be successful in this environment. I know you've seen it and sometimes you have to highlight that for parents or you have to kind of build them a roadmap of what that's going to look like. Cause it's gonna be academic, but it's also gonna be emotional and social like we just talked about. So we're gonna talk about some environmental supports, some visual supports. And I know that you are probably pretty familiar with these, but more about how you can share and teach them to parents how to get outside assistance, and you providing resources to them. So environmental supports. The biggest problem that we're coming across is home is now being split. Home is home home and home is school home. And it's really hard to tell the difference when that's the same place. <laughs> so it can be really important to um, delineate those two. And now for some learners, that might look like I have the same learning space every day. I go there and that's it. But that doesn't work for everyone. So our learners that are on the spectrum, that might really look work for. Um, but, you know, if we have some that have more attention deficits, 
change might be really good. So maybe that can look like, you know, you have a rug or a carpet square or a bean bag that they every day get to take with them to a different room, but that sense of consistency that indicates that it's time for school is that item that they take with them. Or it can be a space that's even comfier than normal that they can only go to when it's school time. So maybe it's a big old pile of pillows or um, I know that there's like pillows with arms on them or like big stuffed animals or something that they only get to do when it's school time. So that way it's even more motivating. Um, you know, we all use in our classrooms usually check-in, check-out systems. So at home, what that can look like is um, I've advised a lot of parents to have a card that has a front and back. So it can be school on one side and home on the other, red and green. It can be pictures. So when it's time for school, you have the child flip it. And then when it's time for school to be over, you have them flip it back. Um, and that's that concrete visual. And then they can, they can see that throughout their day to know what's expected of them. Um, or if, you know, in a lot of classrooms, you have the child's picture or their name and they move it from home to school and then back home at the end of the day. Parents can do that at home too. I know at Dollar Tree, they sell those um, pocket parts and, uh, or, you know, parents can just create something themselves. You can create something to send home, but just something that shows the delineation in a visual way. Um, and also creating a routine. I tell parents all the time to use their backpack, use their school supplies, use their lunchbox. It might seem weird because they're not going anywhere, but those items signal school. So if they're using those items like they normally would, that's just another piece of school that is familiar to them and that separates it from the rest of their environment. So if they're using their lunchbox only for lunch, not for breakfast, not for dinner, that's setting it apart. Um, I know most classes, most especially uh, pre-K classes, have hello and goodbye songs as like part of their circle time. But maybe, you know, at home they have a special hello and goodbye song that's different that they play at the beginning and the end. Or it doesn't have to be hello and goodbye. It could just be a specific song at the beginning and a specific song at the end or a movement activity or something like that. Um, and then task strips or schedules or just, you know, uh, I open my backpack, get out my folder, get out my crayons, sit in my chair. Um, that, that routine of every single day I have to do this really helps too. The other big money topic is behavior. <laughs> um, I am a behavior specialist, so I get asked this a lot. And we're going to kind of talk about the proactive and then the reactive. So proactive, it's always so much better to prevent this behavior before it starts. And when I'm saying behavior, I'm referring to the challenging, escalated behavior we don't really want to see. That's kind of counter counterintuitive. So choices. You might understand as an educator how to give choices. Parents might not. And choices oftentimes are, do you want this or do you want this? But that even just asking that question, asking the child to pick, can be just another demand. So maybe you work with parents on how to phrase things of, okay, I have this and I have this. And it's not really placing a demand, it's just showing the child what's available. So help coach them through how they can embed that throughout the day to have their child feel a little bit more sense of control. Um, that pick your battles mentality, I know it's so hard for everybody, but identify with parents, again, what those must do's are and always prioritize calm and safe over completion. So if, if something is getting really, really hard, back off a little bit and it's okay. Um, so work with parents on understanding that too, because it's so much better to dial it back than it is to launch an escalation in behavior. Be flexible, and this works, this goes for everybody. If, oops, if you're flexible, parents can be flexible. When parents are flexible, their children can be flexible. And if children are flexible, then teachers are more likely to be flexible. So it's just kind of this circle of flexibility. Um, and it's really, really hard when things are so challenging and so frustrating and you've got so much, much pressure put on you. But, you know, and, and mindfulness, again, we'll get into it. That can really help. Um, teach parents how to break down larger tasks. I know in school, we will maybe cross out, you know, two of the things on the worksheet because it might be a little bit too hard or we'll start with something 
that is um, a, a smaller concept that builds into something else. Parents don't necessarily know how to do that. So teach them how to do that. You can teach them in the moment, but you can also work with them. Maybe if you contact them, you know, you have a meeting um, in the middle of the day when there's no kids there or after school or whatever. That kind of leads into the concept that we use in ABA called behavioral moments. So it's you're starting with easy and you're working up from there. We're not coming in hot with long division here. We're starting with what is a number, adding and subtracting, or it's even, it's starting with something that you know is easy for them that might not even be related to what you're doing, but you're leading into what you're going to eventually ask them to do by kind of starting them slow and gradually working up. Breaks. Parents oftentimes don't realize the importance of breaks or don't think that they're allowed. So work with your parents to talk to them about why it's important to give their child breaks, but also give them permission. If they, they can see better on that end, if their kid is getting a little squirrely. Um, so talk with them about what it looks like when they might need a break and what a break can look like because a break looks like something different for every child. They might think, oh, he probably needs to go jump on the trampoline when in reality, maybe he just needs to go crash in the corner and check out for a couple of minutes. Um, we talked about mindfulness. So some of them, there are a couple different types of mindfulness videos. Some are talking um, and some are more like relaxation. So like the more talking ones, the skill building, the um, imagining, I, and I'm actually going to show you an example of one in a little bit. Those would be more helpful just to teach. And then always give clear expectations and a schedule. So be very clear and talk to parents about being very clear about how many is required, when we're going to do this, when you're going to be able to do this, and how long this is going to take. So then the next question is usually, well, what do I do when it's already started? So a lot of these same concepts apply. They're just applied a little bit differently once the behavior has already started to escalate. So choices are still really important, but this might look different. It, like I said before, a, a question choice might be a demand and that could really escalate things. So work with parents on just, maybe even you're not saying a choice, maybe you just put something out there and, and just let the child go to it when they're ready. Um, and that's something where if you have um, a building social worker or if you have a behavior person in the school psych, they can really help you with how to do that as well. That pick your battles mentality still applies. It's a little bit different when behavior starts to escalate and we're worried about safety. Um, prioritize being calm above everything else and talk to parents about not getting wrapped up. I call it dogpiling, where they might start with knocking a pencil off and then they might start with, you know, spitting at the screen, or then they might knock this over and they'll say, I hate you and you're the worst mom ever. And they kind of just dogpile everything and, and work with parents on the importance of it, not attending to all that other stuff and just keeping calm and safe as the priority and not, not taking it personally. Um, and I know that that's, that's really difficult and it's really difficult for us in the moment too. So again, if you have social worker behavior person, they can really help with that too. Um, flexibility, again, if you are, they can be. Um, so breaks now, it's, okay, let's look at these precursor behaviors. Let's look at, you know, is he starting to turn red? Is he starting to sigh a lot? Is he putting his head down? I had a kid one time where he would start to laugh when he would get really upset, and that was my, well, oh, yeah, where it's time to take a break. So work with parents to get to know their child about what it looks like when they need a break. Um, those mindfulness exercises, but instead now they can be, there's ones that have bells that you just listen to, very calming, relaxing, not teaching, just getting us back to functioning level. Again, those clear expectations and schedule, but this time it's going to be focused more on how can you help parents keep safe? How can you help them diffuse the situation? Because again, you're on this end of the computer and you're just watching and you feel kind of helpless. So how can you coach parents on how to diffuse? And then once it is diffused, reintegrate, reincorporate back into the lesson. Um, and maybe this is something that you also help your paras help parents with, because if you're teaching a lesson, you know, you can't just stop. Um, so maybe your para jumps in and, and pulls them out into another uh, breakout room or something like that. Um, and start small. So when we start to see behavior escalate, we have to pull back and we have to just 
work on those building blocks to get back to where we were before. So when we have had an escalation in behavior and we're starting to get back to a good point, we're not going to just dive into the long division that we were doing before. Um, we're going to work up to it. And I know early childhood, not a lot of long division. It was meant to be a little over the top example. Um, but also if they have a behavior plan, how can this be modified for home? So work with you know, your team that wrote the behavior plan about how you can work with parents to help incorporate elements of this behavior plan, even if you can't do it fully. All right, so we are actually going to practice a mindfulness activity. And now I know from the last session that I have to share my audio with you. So I encourage you, especially if your camera's off, we can't see you. I encourage you to participate fully in this video. So if they're asking you to move your arms, close your eyes, anything, I really encourage you to do that with the video to get the full experience, because then we're going to talk about it later. Um. Can you guys hear this, Kim? Yeah, we can hear it. Oh, yay. <laughs> Rainbow relaxation. In this mindfulness practice, you will be stretching your muscles and breathing deeply. You can sit up straight or stand, but make sure you have some space at either side of you as we will be raising our arms in the air. Make sure you're comfortable. Today, we are going to imagine that we are painting a rainbow in the sky and your fingers are the paintbrushes. Start with your hands by your side and your palms facing forwards. Now, when you see the red band of the rainbow start to appear, keep your arms straight and trace it upwards with your paintbrushes. Great! Now the red band is painted, slowly bring your arms back down by your sides. Now you need to match your breathing to your painting. So when you raise your hands up for the next colour, take a big breath in and you can breathe out when you bring your arms back down. Get ready for the orange to appear. Imagine we have dipped our paintbrushes into orange paint. So breathe in and lift the arms up and slowly back down as you breathe out. Now we're going to paint the yellow band. Imagine we have dipped our paintbrushes into the yellow paint. Breathe in as we paint the yellow band and lift your arms up. Now breathe out as you drop your arms down. Now the green band. Breathe in as we paint the green band. Arms up. And breathe out as you drop your arms down. Now the blue band. Breathe in as we paint the blue band, arms up. And breathe out as you bring your arms back down. Now the indigo band. Breathe in as we paint the indigo band, arms up. And breathe out as you bring your arms back down. And now for the final colour, violet. Breathe in and lift your arms up. And breathe out as your arms come down. Well done! Each time you paint the rainbow, the colours are getting stronger and deeper. Your rainbow will shine around you all day and put a smile on everyone's face. All right, so I am going to stop it there.
So how did that make you feel? Put it in the chat. We got some interesting responses in the last session, so I'm, I'm interested to see, but um, what are you feeling right now? Monique really liked it. She said, so good. <laughs> As Isabel said she feels more conscious of her breathing. A lot of people said they felt calm, um, less anxious. Uh, Angelina said she wanted it to be longer. <laughs> there are longer ones out there. <laughs> Yeah, and a lot of people said peaceful, calm, relaxed, out of my head. It helps to get out of your head every once in a while, definitely. It sure does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, last session, we had someone who said that it made them feel more anxious because they have a really hard time slowing down. So they were getting impatient. So I actually have felt like that before when doing this too. Um, so if that's you, uh, it does go away or it does at least diminish a little bit with practice. So keeping that in mind, that could be the case for some of your learners too. But if you start incorporate this, incorporating this even into your lessons, um, that can really help just build that foundation so that when it's necessary to do one of the ones that's maybe a little more relaxing, less words, they're kind of familiar with it. So I'm not sure if you noticed, but I actually have been incorporating mindfulness aspects throughout this presentation. So the little hedgehog guy at the beginning, first of all, I had to put him in because he's so cute, <laughs> but it was something to make you smile, but it was also something that kept going across the screen and you were paying attention to that and you maybe you weren't paying attention to, I don't like the way, way my hair looks today, or I'm really tired of staring at myself in the screen, or can everyone else see like my dirty house behind me? So it really helps tune you into the here and now. And the relaxing nature pictures that I've been using, um, really just helps set the tone as a calm tone. Even this candle picture reminds me of getting a massage. So even then it kind of, it, it makes me a little less tense. And you know, that video, it's incorporating your, your sense of sight. It's incorporating your hearing. It's also incorporating, you know, your physical movement. It's really hard to think about those negative things that are bothering you when you're using so many different things going on at the same time. So I encourage you to think about how, how can you support this at home? How can you embed this into your lessons at home or with parents at home? Um, so real quick, I know that you're all probably, probably pretty familiar with visual support. So we're just gonna go through um, different types. So we have a first then, we have visual schedule, like I was saying before, a task strip or a task analysis, voice boards. Keep in mind how either you can help parents create these, you can create them and send them home, but then you're gonna have to teach them how to use them. So a first then doesn't always have to be you do this, then you get this. A first then can be helpful for those learners, especially early learners that are not ready for a full visual schedule yet because it's too overwhelming. So we can literally be, all right, first we're gonna do a song and then we're gonna play with Play-Doh. So keep that in mind. Um, and break time, you know, choice boards, you might have to work with parents on what choices are appropriate. And maybe you work with your OT on what break time can look like because they might have one idea, but that might not always be accurate. Or maybe they have better ideas than you do, who knows, but work with parents and try to teach them how to do this. Um, access to outside assistance. So this is what I've honestly been helping with a lot this year is helping parents and helping teachers help parents get access to, to resources that are outside of school. So if you have a child that has an autism diagnosis, if they don't already have ABA therapy, that can be something that's really, really helpful. I know we can't recommend, <laughs> um, but we can, if that's something that the parents are interested in, or maybe you just teach them what that is, um, it's so helpful to have someone on the other end of the screen that you can kind of work with and can kind of help um, you know, manage things in your absence. Usually it's only for autism, unfortunately, because insurance is terrible, um, but that's an option. Help them get access to or look for resources or vet speech pathologists or OTs in their area. Um, I know a lot of former or retired or recently graduated teachers um, are starting to do, are doing like learning pods or they're coming in and tutoring. So maybe you can help hook them up with, with that or you know, families might need counseling, the child might need counseling and various types of therapies. There's play therapy, there's even executive functioning therapies out there. So maybe you can work with them to try and contact some of those people. 
again, we're not suggesting that, <laughs> but if that's an interest that they have, or maybe you teach them that that's an option, if they'd like to explore it, then you'd be more than willing to help them. Um, and then there is also a resource guide that will be uploaded into this shared drive for Countywide Institute Day. It's also on the CASE website. So if you go um, under the community tab into Parent University, and then there's a document that says CASE Parent Resources for Remote Learning. And that's a document that is full of, I created that with a um, social worker in District 93. And it's full of visual supports and um, translation, trauma-informed care mindfulness, um, challenging behavior. It's full of so many different resources, websites, videos, all of that. I think it's up to about six pages now. And I keep adding to that. So if for some reason the countywide um, shared drive goes away or you don't have access to it, it's also on the CASE website. And then when I stop sharing my screen, I'm going to drop a link to it in the chat. Um, so, and then just some general things to remember. So parents can help support generalization and everyday learning opportunities at home. They don't need to be the teacher, but they can help be a facilitator of what you're already teaching. Um, make your lesson plans realistic and flexible. We're, we have so many families that are going through so many different things, job loss, family loss, just um, awful situations right now, or they just have multiple kids in remote learning, and that's really hard. So make them realistic and flexible and do what you can to help. Um, also relieve the pressure, you know, reassure your parents, they don't need to know everything to be helpful and to help their child succeed. Reassure them when they're doing something right, when you see that something is working, help give them that positive praise because we all really love that. Um, include parents and even the students in your planning and give them examples of how to reinforce these concepts at home. And then just overall, and I know you're doing this, but continue to be mindful, supportive, and understanding of different home environments and situations because this is just different degrees of difficult for everybody based on their own situation. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to open up if you're, com if you're comfortable um, unmuting yourself or if you just want to type it in the chat. Questions, comments, success stories, things you want to try, just any overall things you want to share. Um, stop sharing my screen and then I am going to drop a link to the um, parent resource guide into the chat box. Jenna, while you're doing that, there was an earlier question. Uh, if we're able to share share the presentation, we we are recording it, so they'll we be able are to see recording it. Too. I don't know what they're going to do with that. We were asked to record it, but they are. Um, I'm also going to drop a, a version of this into the shared drive as well. This presentation. So many windows open right now. Angelina had a comment. She said she really enjoyed it. It was very organized and prepared. Oh, thank you. I actually really love PowerPoints. So that was actually a, uh, a form of mindfulness and self-care for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear you like PowerPoint. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I will say you had a lot of like the links all queued up. Like you can tell you're very skilled in PowerPoint. I am not, so I appreciate those who the links were working, the sound was on, it moved very, um, very well. So as a, someone who's listening to it, it was very organized and my mind didn't wander. So I appreciate Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then actually, it's funny because you said your mind didn't wander. Like, again, in like behavior analysis, there's actually a branch of behavior analysis where you're taught how to like bring people's eyes to certain things and keep people engaged. So I'm, I'm really happy to hear that worked, but also like, I just really like PowerPoint. So that's a great compliment. <laughs> um, and then also reach out to your building supports. Um, your paras will probably have really great ideas and your school social worker, your psychs, talk to your admin. Um, I know like our special ed director also has um, a background as a lawyer. So she has a much different perspective than a lot of other people might. Um, reach out to Case, you know, if you have, um, referrals that you want to do, or if you have a building behavior person. I know BCBAs have not been super uh, in schools up until recently, but it's becoming more of a thing now. So if you have one, then definitely seek that out too. Okay, any final thoughts? 
Otherwise, I will give you the last three minutes of freedom. <laughs> All right, it doesn't look like it. So, um, oh, awesome, good. Oh, and that resource thing that I sent you, like those are full of links that you can send parents, but they're also really helpful to educators just in general. Um, so you don't necessarily have to share them with parents. You can use them to help guide your instruction. But thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. I'm gonna stop recording now. Um,